All right, good morning, everyone. How are you doing this morning? You well? And you're still full, right? Thanksgiving was so good. Man, uh, watching that video of just, just everything that took place to make Thanksgiving happen for 1,250 people to get meals, isn't that exciting? Like, isn't it cool to be that church, right? It's cool to be that church that gives beyond ourselves. And, and, and the same thing with South Sudan, man, that is just so exciting and so encouraging to know that, that dozens of church planners are being supported by, by just us bringing the little bit that we have coming together and making a huge impact. Why don't you guys give it up for just all that God is doing here at Canyon View. I mean, it's just unreal. There's like, it's so cool. So, I mean, I, I could talk about that all, all day, so I'm going to stop. But uh, my name's Gabe, and, and I'm here to talk to you today. And I kind of wanted to take just like a couple minutes and tell you where I come from and how, how my wife, Cecilia, and I and our three boys, Judah, Abram, and Matthias, how we got here. Um, well, we were, I was born and raised in the church. I, I went to a, an Assemblies of God church growing up. And, uh, you know, I went, my mom did the due diligence of bringing me to church, even though I wanted to play video games, you know, and she, she made me, and I'm so glad she did. And so I grew up, and, and I started to, to notice that the gifts that God had given me were, were gifts that were really easy to use in the church. So the church allowed me to learn how to play music. I, I'm up here sometimes with Tim and the rest of the team playing music here. Um, just God gave me this awesome gift, and I try to share it with everyone. And, and, and you know, it was, it was a cool place to learn, and it was a small church, so I was horrible, and they let me play anyway because no one else was there. So, you know, it was great. It was good for me. I, it was probably painful for them, but it was nice for me. And, and uh, you know, I grew, and then I, I got into youth group. I really dove into youth ministry as a teenager. Um, my youth pastor started asking me, hey, would you like to try preaching? And I was like, sure, because, you know, that's easy, right? And I'm like, How hard could that be? And so I got up there and preached my first, like, three-minute sermon, you know. I thought it was going to be, like, 30, and it was, like, two, but... You know, it was, again, it was pretty painful for everyone, but it was cool for me. So you guys are the beneficiaries of that because I got all the, you know, bugs worked out, hopefully, and, and now, now we're ready to roll. But so, so I started serving in my church that I grew up in. Uh, I went to Bible school, and, um, and then I graduated that. And then when I was 19, I started youth pastoring at this church as a volunteer. So my, my philosophy of ministry is just to be literally one step ahead of the people you're leading. And so that's, <laughs> that carries over even to right now, because I got a chance to see this before you, so I'm one step ahead of you to tell you how to do it. So um, did that. I, I got married. I was a part of, just a part of building this really cool outreach youth ministry over there, and uh, just saw hundreds of kids like come and, and hear the gospel that were unchurched, and it was awesome. Uh, I got married to my wife, Cecilia, um, in 2010, and we started having kids and stuff, and, you know, doing what, you know, married people do, and uh, we, we had our third child who's actually sitting right over there. His name is Matthias, and Matthias changed everything. I'll tell you why. Because we were uh, the volunteer worship pastors. Um, I was a volunteer youth pastor. Uh, I was volunteer, kind of guest speaking like I am now. And, and it was all good. I mean, I had, we had lots of great experiences. But when Matthias was born, I realized that going from two boys to three boys was pretty hard. Can you imagine, right? Those of you who have kids and you're like, I already raised them, dude, so you can tell me how to do it, you know, uh, later. But, but we, we decided we needed to take a break. Were you, have you ever in your life just been, like, tired? Like, <laughs> right? If you have kids, you're still tired, right? You slept through the 9 o'clock and you're still tired here. Uh, we, we just got to this point of just, of just exhaustion. And what I now have come to know is a term called burnout. Uh, we, we, we just decided, like, hey, we need to take a break, and we need to sit for a little while. Yeah, anybody ever been in that time where, like, there's really busy times, then there's times where you just got to really scale back and focus. And I was like, I think I need to learn how to be a dad and how to be a, a husband because I don't know how. And I put a lot of energy into that, and I, I'm like, you know, I'm keeping my head above water, so that's pretty cool. Uh, but so we, we went and sat in church for the first time in, in our entire relationship. And um, we realized it was pretty hard to sit 
in the church that you grew up in and in the church that you wore so many hats to serve in. Does that make sense? And so, so we started coming to this place called Kaleo because, because Tim Brown was the worship leader of Kaleo. Uh, and he's a friend of mine. We had played music together in outside venues and, and he had invited me to come play some on Wednesday nights. So we started to come, my wife and I started to come and we brought our boys and I'll tell you what, one of the, one of the things that I appreciate the most of this entire church is, is dropping your kids off with Pastor Peggy. And just like, <laughs> I, I'm serious, like, so, you don't understand like what a blessing it is to have, have someone who is dedicated to pastoring your babies and, and to loving on them, you know? And, and we just felt this overwhelming peace, like they were gonna be okay, and we were able to come and sit and be fed by uh, Pastor Nate Ralston. And, and you know, we, we were here and we were learning and we were loving it. And all the while thinking like, I don't know if we're ever gonna get a chance to do this ever again. And, but God has other plans. You know, you ever seen that? Like, you ever noticed that about God? And, and so here we are today, um, and it's just been an amazing blessing, guys. We, we love serving in this church. We love being a part of you guys. And uh, um, taking over for, for Nate and Kaleo has been a huge blessing for, for my wife and I. And, and how many of you guys can also agree that we have a great pastor? Yes. Yes. And so he, he's been really instrumental in, in kind of mentoring me and helping me prepare for moments such as this one. So, so let's get into it. We're, we're, we're uh, doing an, an Advent series, which we, is pretty common for us to do, um, but we're, we're putting a different spin on it. Vineyard USA has come out with this really cool thing. Will you do me a favor? Will you just hold this booklet up if you got it? Wave it at me. Ushers and greeters don't sleep on anyone. Have you noticed that? If you try to like rush through, they like slip you a you know, a bulletin and a little booklet, and you're like, where did I get this? Okay, you know, they, they don't miss a step, and I can tell by seeing this. So, so it's, a, it's gonna be a series that will take us all the way through till New Year's Eve, okay, or New Year's Day, uh, whatever, you know, New Year, the New Year. And, and so it has some studies to do this, and, and Pastor Kirk and I were talking on uh, Friday night, and men, will you do me a favor? Men, if you're a husband or a dad, will you lift this book up and just show me that you got one? Okay, so this is something that I feel really passionate about, something that I feel needs to be said, and so I'm gonna say it. Men, lead your home, okay? And I'm saying that with love, and I'm saying that as I'm in the trenches with you. Lead your home, okay? Don't be passive, and don't let this slip by, okay? Because this is an awesome time to start a discipleship process with your family, okay? Because God has called you to be the priest of your home. So I'm asking you, please, just take a little bit of time, go through this. I know, I know like work is crazy. I know that all the, you know, all the sports and all this stuff that goes on, it gets crazy. Carve out some time and do this with your family, okay? And so I have to say this because I, I married Cecilia who was a single mom when I met her. Um, I, have, I have this incredibly soft spot for single moms. Um, and the, I heard a term by a guy named Matt Chandler, a great pastor in, in Texas, and, and he said, ladies, where ideals lack, grace abounds. Amen? And so he's saying, you know, if, if you're in a home and, and you're having to spiritually lead your home, I just pray grace would abound all over you and you would have, you would have every um, blessing of doing that as well, okay? So I just wanted to make sure that we, we make sure we're doing this together, okay, guys? It's a way to grow deeper in your faith. It's a way to... Um, to unify us as, as one body, right? We're reading the same things and studying the same things. So guys, please do that. Um, I wanted to just quickly tell you about what this series is gonna be about. Um, we're talking about receiving the blessing. And if you know anything about this time of year, you know, you eat the turkey, no sooner do you do those dishes and then everything flips into holiday mode, right? The, the, you know, Starbucks is all green and all of a sudden it's red, right? Um, and the Christmas music has taken over every major radio station within earshot of you. And you're hearing all of this stuff because, because we know that the holidays are upon us, right? And, and, and it's a great time, don't you think? Like, I know for some, the holidays can actually be tough. But um, overall, the holidays, uh, Christmas season in particular, is a season that, that it pulls at our heart, doesn't it? It's a season of the heart. 
And, and I guess all media forms kind of, we tend to focus on the feel-good stories. Again, the Christmas um, songs. My wife and I, we, we uh, collect Christmas CDs, it seems like. Like almost every CD we buy is, is a Christmas one of sorts. And it's pretty embarrassing, but we listen to Christmas music a lot. And our kids beg us to stop, and we just say no. Um, <clears throat> because that's, that's what being an adult is all about, you know? We can listen to whatever we want. We eat cookies for breakfast, just whatever. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm mostly kidding. But, but so, so we know that, right? And we know that like Christmas, the whole gift giving thing, it, it really is, it's about showing the people that you love that you do love them, right? It's a way that you can sort of tangibly express love for someone, isn't it? to give them a gift, and so that's why we do that. But, but this term, love, is actually quite elusive, is it not? Uh, it sort of has multiple different fragmented meanings depending on who you ask, depending on where they are in their lives, depending on the day, right? Love means different things to different people. And so because of that, we, we, we kind of suffer from not really fully grasping the understanding, but, but 1 John 4, 8 says this, anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is what? Love. God is love. And so we see love incarnate in Jesus Christ, and we see that the completeness of love comes from God, because that's who he is, Right? Yeah, it's just who he is. And I, I, I've never really been big on Advent. I, I don't think we've ever had an Advent calendar or anything like that. I, I think it's a cool thing, uh, but I just, it's kind of skipped me, I guess. And so I, I kind of went backwards again. One, I'm one step ahead of you guys, and I did some homework on Advent. What does it mean? And the word Advent actually means the coming. And... What I love, when, you, when you, you think about that, and what does that mean in relation to Christmas? Well, Advent is celebrating that love came to us. And I love that in the character of Jesus and in the character of God himself throughout the stories of the Bible, if you were to pick up your Bible and start leafing through stories, we see that God always engages man first. He always takes the first step. He always speaks the first word. He, he decides that he's going to come to us. And so Advent is really a celebration of the beauty of the gospel, that though we were sinners, right, Christ died for us. He came to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. And, and it's the beauty of the gospel. And I have to say this, too, because some of us are sitting here, and, and the love part of things of the holidays has not yet hit us. And, and I, I mentioned this in, in the nine o'clock service, is like uh, tomorrow I'm gonna be a part of a funeral for, for a guy that I went to high school with and for his, his four-year-old baby son. Um, and at those times, it gets, it gets hard to see like the love that, that surrounds us. And, and we can see by love being poured out on this family we see love, but I, I have to say this, if you're in a time like this where, where things are feeling hard, where you feel just the pressures, um, when you think of the word Advent, that means the coming, it means that also that he's coming again. That he came once to send, to send salvation for us in the form of Jesus Christ, but he's gonna come again, and he's making all things new. I just, I love that about, about God, because we, we, we have a hard time, right? Because I know my heart wants to love. I want to love my wife and I want to love my children the best way possible. I want to love the people that I serve in Canyon View the best I can. But I know that even on my best day, I fall way short, right? And the pressures of this life sometimes make it to where we focus inward on ourselves and not on anybody else. Is that true? But what I love is that God is making all things new again, and, and one day we will experience perfect love. And just that, that all of the pressures of this life will soon melt away. 
And I think we can look forward to that. And if you need that hope this morning, if that's for you this morning, just grab hold of that, okay? Because I think us as a culture, us as human beings, the human race, we, I think it's fair to say, tell me if you disagree, that we are at a love deficit. We have a love deficit. It's sort of like I just said it. I try my hardest and I do my best to express love and even to receive love and I fall miserably short. Our our culture, we don't get it. We don't understand really what love is. We don't have a super clear picture in society of what love looks like. So therefore, we have a hard time giving it and a hard time receiving it. And I guess it's just fair to say that we need to get to a place before we even dig into the Bible and what it says, we need to get to a place where we feel that tension, you know? Like, I want to love, but I can't love completely. I I want to experience love. I want to receive the love of the people who are trying to show me love. I'm even trying to receive God's love, but there's a tension there that causes us to focus only on ourselves, and and we're, we're not able to receive it fully. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You, like, you, I want to, but I can't all the way. We have to get to a place together where we realize that, and then we can kind of unpack the many facets of, God, of God's love, because, because our, our hope and our prayer is through this series, we're going to look at just these many different aspects of God's love that you might know and be able to receive his love this holiday season, okay? Does that make sense? That, that, that's a series worth teaching? I, I think it is. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would just um, fill this place with your presence. God, I do pray for, for the hearts that are heavy burdened today. I don't know why that's so big uh, on, my, on my mind and on my heart right now. Lord, for people who are struggling, um, God, would you meet them here? And I pray that as your word, as Jesus spoke in your word and as we're going to unpack, God, that you would be living water to us. That if we drink of you, Lord, we'd never be thirsty again. Fill our hearts, Lord. Fill this place. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so, so like I said, over the next few weeks, we're going to attempt to explain and, and unpack and, and just define for you some of the many facets of, of God's love. Okay, and so today we're, we're saying receive the blessing of living water. And, and I'm gonna take you to John chapter four. So if you have a Bible, John chapter four, I'm gonna kind of set the stage for you a little bit so that you know where we're coming from, okay? Jesus, to this point, um, the gospel of John is really cool because, because it gives a perspective that you won't find in, in the other synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the reason for that probably is because John saw Jesus from a vantage point that none of the others did, none of the other authors. Does that make sense? Because John was in the trenches with Jesus. He, you know, he was sleeping on the ground next to Jesus. He was eating meals in people's homes with Jesus. Jesus was telling him how to pray. He taught him how, how to love. He taught him how to do many wonderful things in the name of, in the, name of the Father, right? And, and, and oftentimes, John is referred to as the one whom Jesus loved. So John has a unique perspective. And so far in the Gospel of John, before you get to chapter 4, um, you, see, you see sort of the birth and everything of Jesus, and, and he turns water into wine, right? That's the first time he, he kind of showed that he, that he has some power. And, and he, he talks to Nicodemus shortly thereafter, um, but this is one of the, this is just one of the early, early encounters of Jesus in his public ministry. Okay, and, and he, he talks to a woman uh, from Samaria. And why that's important to know that is because Jews and Samaritans historically do not get along. Okay, it, they, the Samaritans were viewed as unclean because they were partly Jewish and partly Gentile, okay? And, and the Jewish race from its conception has been, has been set apart to this point by, by God, right? And they don't do things the way everyone else does. They're, they're separate and they're, they're holy because they're serving the one true God. And now, now to have these people who are separate, these people who have done things a certain way, to have them mixing uh, races with Gentiles, they, they viewed these people, the Samaritans, as unclean. 
So it would be very, very common for a Jew and a Gentile, or a Jew and a Samaritan, rather, to, to cross paths and not speak, to not lock eyes, not look at each other. Does that make sense? They're, they're not friends, okay? They, they don't like each other's posts on Facebook. They do not retweet each other's tweets, okay? None of that is going on. And so the other thing that's significant here is the time of day at, at which this, this interaction occurs, okay? Because they're, they're at a well, the well of Jacob, and, and, and they're there in the midday. So in the midday, no one's usually at the well because the custom was that the, the women, the Samaritan women would go at evening time uh, and this woman in particular happens to be coming in midday. And what I, you believe uh, to be true from, from reading this is that she, she probably wanted to avoid human interaction. And that's why she came at a time where she thought no one would be there. And it's also, uh, it seems as though Jesus passes by Samaria. He, he could have taken the long way around to get where he was going, but he, he passed through Samaria, and it's believed that he, was, he passed through on, on divine instruction, by divine instruction, that he was being led by the Father, being led by the Holy Spirit to go this way through a place where the people typically had no contact with Jews, okay? So that's, that's where we're starting. That's where we're looking. John chapter 4, uh, verse 7. I'm going to pick it up, okay? A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. I'm going to stop right there. So who spoke first? Jesus, right? Jesus engages this woman who, who it would have been completely culturally acceptable, completely normal for him to completely ignore her but he breaks the silence to speak to her. Does that make sense? So, so that's something significant in and of itself. And then we'll figure out why. Verse eight, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. That's a fair question. She's saying, what are you doing talking to me? You know how this works. You know how the world works. We're supposed to just kind of breeze by each other. In verse 10, Jesus answers her, if you knew the gift of God, I'll say that again, if you knew the gift of God and who it is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. You know what I, I like about Jesus? I, you know, I love reading about Jesus. You know why? Because he, he does not look very much like what the social norms of his day looked like. He, he did things in such a way that his agenda rarely followed the routine ways of doing things. Did you know that? He, he always was kind of stirring the pot in a certain way. You know, this person, it's, it's socially unacceptable to talk to her, so not, I'm going to talk to her. Right? How many of you guys have a little of that in you? Like I do. You know, like the little candy dishes that just say, please take one. Sometimes I take two, you know? <laughs> Sometimes I take one and bite it in half and put the other half back. <laughs> Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> My dad actually used to tell me, I'd say, have a good day, dad. He would tell me, Don't tell me what kind of day to have. I was like, All right, have a whatever day you want to have. Um, <laughs> But Jesus is like that. He engages this conversation with this woman, and, and he, he's the primary. He, you know, he's not waiting for her to talk to him. Well, if she says hi to me, I'll say hi back. No, he goes right up to her and says, hey, give me a drink. And she, she freaks out, you know? But, but he engages first. But you know, in the word of God, it says that we love, right, because he first loved us. 
He engages that with us. So the first thing that this passage teaches us is that Christ is the living water that quenches. He, he explains that if you even knew who I was and who sent me, you'd be asking me for something to drink. And I love the, practi- the practicality of this girl. She's like, you don't even have a spoon, dude. Like, what are you, how are you gonna give me some water? You know, but the, the term living water, has, it actually has a double meaning. He's saying that, yeah, first of all, the, the more practical, normal term for, for living water is actually fresh water, like fresh water that comes from, you know, from a flowing source. And, and that's the best kind of water. The, the prophets talk, I think, I believe in Isaiah, he talks about how um, they, the people of Israel, they, they were used to drinking the living water of God, right? That, that's the freshest source of water is the water that's moving and the water that's active. Does that make sense? And he said, you traded it in to drink water from a cistern. Does anybody know what a cistern is? Like a cesspool? Uh, the best way I can describe it to you is if you have a, 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 a swimming pool and you don't cover it, and then the rain just collects in there. Who wants to go have a big old glass of that water? It, he's saying, you're trading in you know, the living water of God for this just gross, stagnant, disease-infested water. And so he's saying, I have living water, the best water that there is in the physical realm. And also, several places in the scripture, living water is used to describe the Holy Spirit. So he's saying that both of these things. And then the other thing that he gets to is that spiritually we are all longing to know the God of creation and his purpose for us. He's saying, you're thirsting for something. And, and he's saying, you know, like that, this is why it's so important. Uh, the Thanksgiving outreach that we just watched, what happens at TFAP, what, uh, when we give away food, like the, the government food supply thing that we do, feed lots of families. And we go out to Kimwood and we go out to Racket Club and, and we bring meals, right? You guys know we do all this stuff. We like to feed people here. And, but you know, we could feed them until they're so full we have to roll them out the door, right? <laughs> but they're still gonna be hungry again tomorrow. That's why we have to continue to preach the gospel and intentionally push people to Jesus because he's the only thing that can quench the longing in their spirit so they would never thirst again. Because no matter how good of a service we provide to people, if not for pushing them towards a growing, active relationship with Christ, they're just gonna wake up hungry again. We have to give them something that's gonna satisfy the deepest longings of their hearts. So we'll pick it up in verse 15 right here. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come draw water. Again, very practical. That'd be nice to just drink water once and then just be good, you know? Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. This is Jesus, dude, I love this man. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you, are ne- you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. He's basically saying, I just Jedi mind tricked you, right? Because <laughs> these are not the droids you're looking for, you know? And he's saying like, yeah, I know. And he asked her a question to which he already knows the answer. You know, ever know people like that? Uh, and he's saying, yeah, what you said is true. The woman said to him, verse 19, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. You think? (laughs) Verse 20. But then, you know, she's like, okay, this guy has some power. This guy has some supernatural divine knowledge, right? But then in verse 20, it kind of, it peaks a little bit, just a teeny bit of defensiveness in her, okay? Listen to this. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. So she's okay, I'll push it back to you. Who's right? My fa- our fathers do this, and we think it's good. So don't really, you don't really get to tell me how to live, Jesus, because you don't understand. This is, this is our culture. This is our thing over here. And you, we say this is right. You say this is right. So what's the big deal? What I love about this is it, it reveals another character, uh, characteristic of Christ. Is number two, Christ is the living water that surprises. He caught her off guard, huh? I love that. And he, he's proving to her, because he, he, he has this way of gently, yet super firmly, getting this person's attention. 
Maybe some of you are in a place in your life right now where God is trying to get your attention. Does he not have some super creative ways of doing this? And, and you're thinking like, okay, I'm listening now because, you know, like he, he kind of calls her to the carpet a little bit and says, hey, uh, I see what's going on here. And, and I know this and, and you think people don't know, but I know. And then you're like, ooh, Jesus has a way of like, I'm like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And then I hear, th this is actually a good form for this, during a sermon, and I'm like, oh, I'm not good, I need help, you know? <laughs> like sometimes, sometimes God reveals to us things that he wants to work on, and, and we think we're doing okay, and out of nowhere, it's just, we get, oh, oh man, I need some help. And that's kind of what he's doing to her. But what I love about it is that he has already earned the right to be heard by engaging and, and one who other Jews would simply avoid. He's earned the right to say these things to her because he already engaged her. He already saw her when other Jews would look past her. Does that make sense? So he's already done for her what, what no other Jewish person would do. And he just says, hey, I see you. You and I are both human beings. And so he earns the right to kind of ruffle the feathers a little bit because he's already engaged and, and kind of decided that he was going to teach her something and show her something that day. So let's close it out. Verse 21 says this, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. He's basically saying, you know what? There's gonna come a day where we're just gonna level the playing field, where it really doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter what you've been through, it, where there's gonna be a different way to do things. And verse 23 says this, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Again, who's initiating, who's seeking? God is. Verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Then she responds. Verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he, tells us, he will tell us all things. So she's making a statement of faith. Is that, you understand? Like he, She's saying, I know that one day somebody's gonna come to rescue us because, because anybody who had any knowledge of Jewish culture was awaiting a Messiah, was awaiting a savior to come in and rescue the people and bring back order into Israel. And so she's making a faith statement saying, I know that this is gonna happen. I know that what you're saying is true. And then Jesus says to her in sort of a Yoda fashion, I like to call it, verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. I really butchered that in the nine o'clock. I was like, who talks like that? He just say, it's me. You know, like I understand that. I get that better. I who speak to you am he. He's saying, it's me. And so he reveals to her that he is the Messiah. And that's one of the first accounts in the Gospels where he reveals, and he reveals it to a person that he shouldn't even be talking to because that's how Jesus rolls, right? He does things that you wouldn't expect him to do. He doesn't, he doesn't follow your sim simple, silly rules. He does what he knows is right and what he knows is from the Father. And so the last thing we learn about Christ is that he's the living water that softens. And have you ever been around uh, uh, just, just the landscape that, that's by the water? and how everything is so lush and everything's so green, and the, the soil's so soft and so well fed. He, he just takes this heart that has been through so much, that's so hard, and he starts to soften it by saying that one day, it's gonna be about the condition of your heart and not where you've come from. And that's really the beauty of the gospel as well. What Jesus has done for us is that he's opened up the playing field and he's leveled it out and saying, the condition of your heart is what's important. If you guys have been coming for the Horizons campaign, there's a message that's been drilled into you over and over and over again. It's not about how much you give, it's about your heart, right? And, and, and again, you see it here again. 
He's saying it's not about where you're from. It's not about your background. It's not about your social status. It's about your heart. He levels the playing field for all of us, and that's why this news is good news for us. So I guess the bottom line is this. Um, The bottom line is that we have a lot in common with this woman, don't we? Because we we have done things we're not proud of. Uh, I think many of us, in in an attempt, honestly, that was probably pretty innocent at first, um, have searched for love, have searched for something to quench the thirst that we have in our souls. And we go through lots of different ways and lots of different avenues to try to do that. Some of us use our job and our career path as something to try to quench just the longing we have to be accepted, the longing we have to be liked, to be loved, to be praised. Some of us seek that within our families. Who, our families are full of good-willed, good-hearted people, but broken people, right? And we know that no matter how much we try, no matter how much I try to, to love Cecilia the way that Jesus would, I come up short, man. And my love, it doesn't quench. It doesn't satisfy completely. So we, we have to really, really put ourselves in the place of, of this woman because Christ has engaged you. Christ is pursuing you. Christ longs to quench the thirst in your heart. So there's really not that much of a difference, is there? And again, we're, we're working with this, with this love deficit that says, man, I don't, know, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to give love to people. I don't even know how to receive the perfect love of Christ because we find ourselves uh, trying to go down the avenue of working for it and earning for it. And if I volunteer, and if I do this, and if I do that, and if I change this behavior, if I cut out that addiction, then maybe, maybe I can receive the love of God. And he's just saying to you right now, where you are, he wants you to receive the gift of living water today. And you could have been in church for a really long time and never caught that. I just want to make sure you know. I, I am talking to those of you who, who are like, you know, I feel like I'm sort of on the outside. I'm not really sure if I, I buy into this whole Jesus thing. I don't know if he is who the Bible says he is. I'm talking to you. God is pursuing you. God is drawing you here. You came here this morning with the intention of trying to figure something out. I, I think whether you came for the first time or the millionth time, that's where we're at, right? We're trying, and that's why we're here. But you could have come to church a lot of times and missed that. That you don't have to work. You don't have to, you don't have to prove yourself worthy of God's love because I'll just tell you, you're not. And he loves on you anyway. So, so this, this moment we're gonna spend together just reflecting, okay? I want you to really make this personal now and start to, to apply this to your life because it's a great story and it's great for this woman, but, but we could hear the story and not let it seep into our own life and not apply the filter to our life. So take a moment to reflect um, on where you search for love and how you resist true love. Okay, let's pray today. Bow your heads, close your eyes with me. Father, we welcome you here. Lord, I I really sense that you are um, drawing people to you right now. I think you're drawing people from the outside and you're saying, hey, you may have never heard this before, but I have the living water that will make you never thirst again. It will satisfy the deepest longing of your heart. And I see you calling those of us who who have walked with you but somehow got misguided a little bit and somehow we start to put our hope in things. We start to put our hope in programs, even in churches and pastors. And God, you're calling us back to center. Calling us back to center to receive your love because all of those wells run dry eventually besides your perfect love. Lord, I pray that you would speak and move. God, you would just slice right to the heart of us. God, I pray that you would be the living water and soften our hearts right now so we can receive that love. In your name we pray, amen.
Okay, guys, I wanna, I want, we're gonna sing this last song. I want you to reflect. Um, but I have some practical steps for you because, because I truly believe that you can go and you can hear uh, the Bible being taught and it, and it can make sense and it can click with you. But right as soon as we dismiss from this place, life just keeps going, right? And it's easy to forget. So I wanna give you a couple steps. The first one is this. Today and right now as we're singing this last song, ask yourself, what am I thirsting for? What am I thirsting for in my life right now? And the second is over this week, as you go through this, um, and you spend some time with Jesus going through this and and your regular reading that you do, um, seek your fulfillment from the Lord because he's gonna start revealing it to you. This is an area where you seek fulfillment and see how it's making, how it's leaving you lacking and leaving you longing for something more. And when you see that, just correct that and say, I don't find my fulfillment in my job title. I don't find my fulfillment even in my wife and children and and our family and how good we look to everyone else or in our social status or by the things that we've accomplished or our educational background. We're saying none of that quenches the thirst of my soul. And we're saying, Jesus Christ, you and you alone are the only one who can quench the, the thirst in my soul. So let's worship and let's reflect. And I'm actually gonna ask the ministry team if you'd come up as well so that we can connect our faith with you and we can pray with you.